Hello and welcome back to Craig Fay and Builds a Clock. Uh, uh, holy cow, did you see that? It, it's running, it's working. There's stuff spinning and it's swinging and it's a it's a clock, I guess. I don't I don't know. In any case, I wanted to give you a quick preview of where we're gonna wind up at the end of this episode, especially considering that last episode was a bit of an unintentional detour. So if you haven't seen episode two, you can check it out here. Uh, but basically, I spent a lot of time in my kitchen sink uh, pouring water out of jugs and while uh, I, Craig Fay, was still hosting and while those jugs did turn out to be uh, clocks, uh, there wasn't a lot of building going on. But hey, two out of three ain't too bad. But on this episode, we are going to get back to our big ugly mess of a clock and we're going to build something that's going to emulate the steps that we learned about in episode two with our water clock. So we're gonna build something that is gonna allow the weight of our power source to drop by very small increments many times rather than crashing down to the ground in one powerful but ultimately useless display of gravity. And the coolest part is this by the end of this episode, you are going to be able to recognize what we've built as a clock. That's right, this thing right here, you are going to recognize as a clock. So let's get to it. To the task at hand. So what we're trying to accomplish is we're trying to get the weight of our power source to drop by small equal increments all of which are gonna take the same amount of time. So it's gonna drop a little then stop, it's gonna drop a little then stop, and it's gonna drop a little and then stop. To accomplish this, we are going to use a crown wheel. Now it is called this because it kind of looks like a fancy king hat, or might if it wasn't made out of wood and really poorly constructed. Uh, in any case, it's a circle with an odd number of teeth all pointing in the same direction. It can be any odd number. I chose nine uh, because nine teeth spaced over a circle means that they're 40 degrees apart and 40 is a nice even number that's easy to measure and easy to mark out. Um, but it can be any odd number and we'll explain why that is in a minute. To build a crown wheel, I cut a circle out of a quarter inch piece of board. Now, since cutting circles is so difficult, I actually created a jig for my Dremel that rotated around a nail in the middle of the board. And once I had the circle, I then measured out 40 degrees Degree increments and using a combination of my Dremel and my drill I created little slots for the teeth to fit into. I then cut out the teeth using a coping saw and included a little tab at the bottom. That, that tab I inserted into the slot in the wheel and glued the teeth into place. The back of the crown wheel I uh, glued this collet. Now I've been calling these collars uh, but apparently when you use something like this to attach uh, something to a shaft it is actually called a collet so I'm gonna call it a collet. So I glued this collet onto the back of the wheel which allowed me to attach it to the shaft of our power source. With the power source wound up, I can place one of the teeth of the crown wheel right at the top there, and I'm just gonna put my finger against that tooth so the crown wheel can't turn and the weight doesn't fall. But you notice something pretty interesting. If you follow my finger straight across the wheel, you'll notice that right at the bottom here, there is a gap that I can move this finger in and out of without really touching any teeth. And if I put my finger there and then release the finger at the top, the crown wheel is going to advance, the weight is gonna drop until it gets stopped by my finger on the bottom. And then if you look directly opposite this tooth here at the top of the wheel, you'll now see that there is a gap. I can move my finger in and out of without touching any teeth. And that's why having an odd number of teeth is so important. So that directly across from every tooth is a gap. And if I, keep alternating my fingers in and out like this, the crown wheel is going to advance half the distance between the teeth every time, which in our case is gonna be 20 degrees, and the weight is going to drop a little bit. Now this should go without saying, but please do not stick your fingers into moving machinery. There's obviously a better way, and we're gonna talk about that in a second, but first we need to acknowledge that this crown wheel is wobbling like crazy. And it turns out that everything I built in episode one wasn't very good. Like somehow the shaft of the power source isn't even level. So to fix that, I had to spend an entire day tediously rebuilding everything I did in episode one. Mm -hmm. 
good news is that after all that tedious work, the shaft is finally level. Oh, come on. Actually, I'm pretty happy that I encountered this problem now because it led to a change in my design philosophy that I think is actually going to save me a lot of headaches down the line. Originally, I thought, okay, I've got a half inch shaft, so if I need it to spin freely, it's gonna have to be in a hole slightly bigger than that, which totally makes sense because the half inch holes that I drilled into the collets were actually providing a pretty good friction fit. It was really tight, uh, and I thought, okay, there's no way that uh, the shaft is gonna be able to spin in a hole that tight. So instead, I went with the next drill size up, and I drilled it directly into the base of the clock. My thought on that was, Okay, I'm working with some pretty imprecise tools. I'm working with some pretty imprecise materials. So if I just go with the next drill size up, if I give myself the most wiggle room I possibly can, then that's gonna be easier. But the problem with that approach is that if a board isn't cut quite straight or level or a hole is drilled off center or a little too big, all those little mistakes can actually add up rather than canceling each other out. And when that happens, I have no way to fix it other than building it from scratch again where I may still make the same mistakes. So what I really need to do is change my approach so that I can make those mistakes and be able to make fine adjustments later on. First I drilled some half inch holes into some small pieces of quarter inch board and then sanded the inside edge so that the shaft had enough room to rotate freely. I then placed those boards over top of the existing holes on the clock base and was able to shift them around until I finally got the shaft perfectly level. Uh, once I had that, I just screwed those boards onto the base of the clock so that if I screwed up or needed to make adjustments later, I could. That's another lesson I learned while doing this. I'm not going to glue anything together anymore. It's all gonna be mechanical fasteners. Everything I've glued together, I have later wanted to change, and that includes the collet on the back of the crown wheel. So once again, because I am using a hand drill, the hole on the inside of the collet was not perfectly perpendicular to the face of the collet. In other words, it was crooked and it was making the crown wheel wobble, which is not something I realized until after. I had glued it on. So in order to fix it, I had to file out the inside of the hole to give it a little play to move back and forth, and then was barely able to drill four holes all the way around it that I could put screws into. And tightening the screws allowed me to adjust kind of the, the tilt and alignment of that crown wheel until I was able to get it perfectly perpendicular to the shaft. But getting back to what we're actually trying to accomplish, which is finding an alternative to jamming our fingers into moving machinery. Or put more precisely, how are we going to get that crown wheel to start and stop alternately without jamming our fingers into it? And the solution to that is the verge. This is a verge. It is a shaft and it has two paddles attached to it. These paddles are known as pallets. And these uh, are just the collets that I've built before with a little groove cut inside them that the quarter inch board sits in. And then they're attached to the shaft using a little screw there. I mount the shaft of the verge uh, in its own stand. Uh, the bottom I have sharpened like this so it will sit in a small hole in the bottom plate and the top passes through a half inch hole in the top plate. So once again, uh, learning from what I had done before, I can adjust those plates back and forth to get the shaft completely vertical. So what does this do? Well, somebody in ancient history noticed something very interesting about how the teeth on a crown wheel move. Looking at the face of our crown wheel as it's rotating, you can see that a tooth at the top of the crown wheel is moving towards the left and a tooth at the bottom of the crown wheel is moving towards the right. If we then look down from above and take one of those pallets on our verge, press it up against a tooth at the top, it is going to want to spin that verge shaft in a counterclockwise direction. Alternatively, if we take one of those pallets on the verge and press it up against a tooth on the bottom, it is going to rotate the shaft in a clockwise direction. If you space the pallets on the verge out properly, somewhere around 90 degrees, what happens is as the top tooth of the crown wheel pushes that top pallet away, the verge rotates and brings the bottom pallet into contact with that bottom tooth. That stops the crown wheel for a second. And then as that bottom tooth pushes that bottom pallet 
away, it once again brings that top palette back into contact with that top tooth, once again stopping the crown wheel. This goes on and on and on, back and forth, alternating directions, allowing the crown wheel to advance a little bit every time. The Verge is also the reason that having that wobbly crown wheel was such a problem. If the crown wheel and the Verge shaft aren't parallel, that will cause the teeth of the crown wheel to move in and out, which could result in the teeth jamming up against a pallet or slipping past them or even missing them entirely. Together, the crown wheel and the Verge are known as a Verge escapement. Verge escapements started to appear in European tower clocks some point around the 1200s, but they were used in almost every single clock and watch up until the 1600s. So even though better alternatives started to be developed at that time, Verge escapements were still used in uh, clocks and watches well into the 1850s. And the reason for their amazing staying power is that in addition to being pretty simple, actually really simple. I mean, I was able to build one, um, but they're also really good at what they do. But what do they do? What are, what are they doing? What is it accomplishing? Well, remember in our first episode, the problem we encountered was that a falling weight was providing constant force, which caused constant acceleration. With the escapement, we have force pushing the verge one way and then pushing it back the other. So the force is no longer constant, it's alternating back and forth. And just like pushing a block away and then pushing it back to its starting position results in the block not having gone anywhere or moving zero distance, over one back and forth cycle of the verge, the forces also average out to zero. And zero force means zero acceleration. So if things aren't speeding up or slowing down, if there's no acceleration, that means that their speed is staying the same or staying constant, which is exactly what we wanted in order to tell time. And while this doesn't look like any clock you'd be familiar with yet, the oscillating verge does provide one very recognizable feature, the distinct tick-tock of a clock. Now, if you listen carefully, in addition to the ticks and tucks, you'll probably notice a couple of tacks, tecks and tucks in there too, which we will get to later. But you have to admit, it sounds like a clock. And in fact, we could just put a dial on this thing and measure how many rotations it goes through and we're done. We've created a timekeeping device. Mission accomplished, Craig Fay has built a clock, series over. Except we don't typically measure time in increments of whatever Craig's clock happens to produce, we typically measure time in 60 second increments. Uh, in fact, we like those increments so much we actually have a name for it, which is called a minute. Uh, so it would be nice to somehow be able to control how fast that verge is swinging back and forth. And that's exactly what we're gonna do in the next episode where we look at the foliate regulator and I finally admit that we're traveling in circles and not in straight lines. So that does it for this episode. If you enjoyed yourself, uh, please remember to like. And if there's anything else that you want to see covered on the next episode or upcoming episodes, or maybe something that needs a little more explanation, please let me know down in the comments. Until next time, my name's Craig Fay. Oh.